Let's get to week two of our series called Knowing and Encountering God. This is actually, as I mentioned last week, it's a two-part series, not a two-week series, but a two-part series that that, uh, sort of revolves around Easter. And so for this part of the series that leads up to Easter, we're really focusing in on who God is. And there's two ideas that sort of together form uh, really the foundation for for, um, why we're talking about who God is and focusing on his nature and aspects and a- attributes. Two ideas are this. Number one, there, are <clears throat> there is a world of difference, a world of difference between what you intellectually know about God versus how you view him personally. A world of difference between those two things. At least there can be. Uh, but, but secondly, and sort of close to the rage to this first idea, is that your view of God, how you view him personally, has absolutely profound impact on your life. And I would go so far as to say that, that most of the time when a person who has a relationship with God is not experiencing, maybe this is going to hit home with some of you, a lot of times when, when, when a person has a relationship with God, but they're not experiencing the health and the growth and the vitality and the vibrancy and the deep level transformation that they want to see in their relationship with God, most of the time that goes back to the reality that they're trying to get to know a God that they do not see clearly. And I'm going to circle, I'm going to return to that idea. I'm not going to say circle back because some of you hear that way too much in your professions. It's like the classic Zoom statement that means nothing. We're not going to circle back to that. We'll return to it. Uh, So my hope, uh, especially through this first leg of this series, is that Um, in focusing in on who God is, that we as a community would begin to see him more clearly, and then in seeing him more clearly, we would be changed in ways that we never even believed were possible. So last week, we we opened this series, we talked about how God's a God who can be known, um, which this isn't easy, by the way. We're doing this in five weeks, so we we, we were kind of asking the question, okay, if I can only tell you five things about God, uh, what would those five things be in these five teachings? Um, so building off of last week that he's a God who can be known, we're going to be talking about an attribute of God that can be phrased in a number of different ways for the sake of simplicity. We're going to be talking about today the fact that God is a God who is sovereign. And to, um, to explain that to us, we're going to be spending some time in Psalm chapter 8. It only has nine verses, so I'm going to read the whole psalm to us. It says this, <clears throat> Yahweh our Lord, how magnificent is your name throughout the earth. You've covered the heavens with your majesty. Because of your adversaries, you've established a stronghold from the mouths of children and nursing infants to silence the enemy and the avenger. When I observe your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you set in place, what is man that you remember him, the son of man that you look after him? You made him little less than God and crowned him with glory and honor. You made him Lord over the works of your hands. You put everything under his feet, all the sheep and oxen, as well as the animals in the wild, the birds of the sky, and the fish of the sea that pass through the currents of the seas. Yahweh, our Lord, how magnificent is your name throughout the earth. This is God's word. <clears throat> What's happening in Psalm 8 is uh, David is, is coming to understand something that as an Israelite, he had been taught his whole life. The difference is it's becoming more than just an intellectual idea for him. Uh, he, he's coming to understand God in a way that y- you can see it in the last verse of the psalm when he just exclaims, there's a reason that your, your version puts an exclamation mark at the end of it, Yahweh, our Lord, how magnificent is your name. What's happening is, is that David is having an encounter with God, a deeply personal encounter with God, that he, he basically is kind of bursting at the seams with excitement and joy and, and all the things that, that every human being wants. And what David realizes about God in this psalm is is it's all together, and at the same time, it's amazing, it's unsettling, and it's comforting. And so those are the three lenses that I want to look at this psalm through. I want to look at the amazing thing that this shows us about God, the unsettling question that it raises about us, and then the profoundly comforting truth that really does, as it works its way into our hearts, um, it has the power to completely change how we live in the ways that we all want to change. So that being said... Uh, we'll begin today by looking at the amazing thing that this psalm shows us about God. We'll start in verse 1. It says, Yahweh, our Lord, how magnificent is your name throughout the earth. You have covered the heavens with your majesty. So what's happening in verse 1 there 
is that as David looks out into the physical world, he, um, he sees the glory of God, uh, which obviously David's not alone there. I mean, as long as mankind has been around, countless men and women have attested to the fact that when they simply observe creation, it, it brings them to this conclusion that there must be a creator behind this all. And I think it's important to note, especially in the culture that we're in, that not everybody arrives at that conclusion when studying nature. But what's interesting is that even, even today in, in, the, in the modern West, <clears throat> the modern secular West, you hear me say all the time, even in our culture, the, the, the leading kind of top um, uh, scientific atheistic minds, when they either deliver speeches or write books, they'll still engage with this idea that the physical world in and of itself is evidence of a creator. Of course, they don't agree with that conclusion themselves being atheists, but um, th- those, the, like the top thinkers, whether it's Stephen Hawking, Richard Dawkins, Sam Harris, you name it, if you, if you read the books they write or the speeches that they give, they'll speak to this idea about whether or not creation um, is pointing to the reality that there is a creator. And the fact that they even engage with that idea is in and of itself proof that it's an idea that's worth engaging with. It's an idea that carries a great deal of in- influence with a whole lot of people um, because, as David has come to terms with here, as Scripture affirms elsewhere, the created world in and of itself can lead you to the conclusion uh, that there is a creator. And, and David actually walks through this in more than just a general way. I mean, verse 1, he's kind of broadly saying, yeah, that, that the world is big, and so there must be a big God, you know, but, but it's actually a little bit more personal than that for David. If you uh, follow his, his um, train of thought to verse 3, and you, you pay real careful attention to how he says this, he says, when I observe your heavens, the work of your fingers, and the moon and the stars which you set in place, it, it, commentators have pointed out, David does not refer to, the, to the, the, the moon and the stars and the heavens. He doesn't call that the work of God's arm or even the work of God's hand, but the work of God's fingers. So I'll, I'll ask you the question, what do you call someone who works with their fingers? The answer is an artist. <clears throat> An artist designs with their fingers. And, and so um, I'm sure that you've been in a situation like this before. I certainly have a number of times in my life. The reason that the natural world, at least on occasion, has the ability to move you the way that a work of art can is because according to the Bible, the created world is a work of art. It's been designed by a divine artist. And that's exactly what David's coming to terms with here. That it's more than just in an impersonal way, it shows his glory, but he's beginning to sense there's a God that's personally designed all of this with his fingers. It, you know, it sort of use a more modern analogy. Um, <clears throat> nobody drives to Mount Rushmore and says, look at, at what the wind and the rain and erosion and natural disasters have done to that rock face. You know, that bears a striking resemblance to four faces of four individuals that have an influential role in this nation's history, uncanny. Nobody does that. You look at Mount Rushmore and you immediately are, are you know, struck, you're caught up uh, in the reality that a, a, a very skilled, highly intelligent designer would have had to uh, create what you're looking at. And on a far grander scale, when you look at, you know, when you look at the laws that govern our universe... When you look at the distance between the earth and the sun, when you look at the speed of the earth's rotation, when you look at the size and gravitational fields of the planets surrounding the earth that shield the earth from asteroids and meteors, when you look at the chemical balancing of our atmosphere, the fact that we have an atmosphere at all, uh, it's as though someone has fine-tuned millions if not billions of dials very specifically so that life could flourish here on earth. And the more that you learn about the physical world, the harder it is to simply say that that's the product of, of, of time and chance. And so just to kind of complete the thought here, what's happening is that David uh, looked out into the universe, which we now know is larger than our most powerful telescopes can see and, and more complex than our most powerful microscopes can see, uh, and he's, he's, he's coming to terms with reality that this whole thing was designed by the fingers of God, which begs the question, what kind of God are we dealing with here? And that question is answered in the first and final verses of this psalm. He is magnificent. He is a magnificent designer. So let me just pause here. Uh, I mentioned um, on the front end of this teaching, and I think I said it again last week, that, that the point of this series is... is 
really the idea that undergirds it, why it's even worth talking about who God is and what he's like, is because how you view God personally has thundering implications for your life. So what I'd like to do is just draw out one implication, uh, one implication for your and my life that comes from this idea that God is this grand designer of everything in the universe. <clears throat> this is an illustration that I heard a pastor give. Um, he said that he heard this. He was in a camp in Colorado after he'd just become a believer. Uh, the teacher there was a, was a really brilliant woman, and he said that this illustration forever altered the way that he thought about God and the way that he approached God. Here's how the illustration goes. <clears throat> If you were, so, so the distance between the earth and the sun, the distance between the earth and the sun is give or take 93 million miles. If you were to reduce that distance to the thickness of a sheet of paper, this is going to give you an idea of, of, of uh, you know, the size of the universe. If you were to reduce the distance between the earth and the sun to the thickness of a sheet of paper, then the distance between the earth and the next nearest star would be a stack of papers 70 feet high. And the distance between Earth and the end of our Milky Way galaxy would be a stack of papers 310 miles high. It's how big our galaxy, just our galaxy is. And of course, what we now know is that our galaxy is essentially one of hundreds of billions in the universe. Basically, our galaxy is the equivalent of a grain of sand in the Sahara Desert. And, and so this woman addressing the class said, uh, if God designed all of this, uh, and according to Hebrews, he upholds all of it with just a word of his power, his pinky finger as it were, the question is, is this the kind of God that you invite into your life to be your assistant? <laughs> you can't even ask the question without chuckling. Is, is this the kind of God that we should approach like Aladdin approached the genie, where we just ask him for stuff? You know, where, we, where we, we, we use him as a means to an end to try to get him on board with my plans and my goals and my agenda for my life? Of course not. This is a God that we should surrender to without condition or qualification. That's just one of who knows how many implications you could draw just from what this, this, uh, this verse, this, this psalm is telling us about God. But again, let me pause here and point something out. What we're talking about right now, the idea that the, the physical universe um, in and of itself points to a creator God. Uh, this is called something, it, it, it's usually referred to, you may have heard this before, as general revelation. If all we had was general revelation, then we could intuit several things about God. We, we, could, we could kind of guess just by looking around that, that God is brilliant, that he's powerful, that he's creative, that he's all kinds of things. But what general revelation alone, follow me here, what general revelation alone will not tell you is whether or not God can be trusted. It might tell you that he's wise, that he's, that he's creative, that he's brilliant, that he's powerful, all those kinds of things. What it will not tell you is that he loves you personally and can be trusted. And that actually is exactly where David goes next. So if, if you read this psalm carefully, you notice that there's a real tension that kind of boils to the surface because right after David comes to terms with how big this God is, it almost by necessity forces him to ask a really unsettling question. I said on the front end, we talk about the amazing thing that this shows us about God, and then the unsettling question it begs about ourselves. The question is found in verse four. It says, what is man that you remember him, the son of man that you look after him? What is man? There's, there's different ways to read this, this question, but what's happening here is that as David begins to perceive the vastness of the universe and the immensity of the God that must be behind all of this, that fact alone, not only does it not comfort David, but it's actually profoundly unsettling to him. Basically, what he's asking here, when he asks the question, what is man? You're, you're talking about a God who designs planets with his fingers. When David's asking the question, what is man? He's saying, but who am I in the grand scheme of this? You know, who, who are we? We're nothing. There's no way that a God of that scope could even have the time to think about, you know, that, that beings like us could, could possibly matter to him. And what, what, what David's showing us here in verse 4 is that it'll never be enough for you to simply believe in God in a general way. And I, I remember back in my days in the fire department, I, almost, I, don't, I don't know that I met anybody in the fire department who was an atheist, but what I met a lot of 
was guys who would simply say, yeah, I mean, there's, there's got to be something or someone out there, some kind of force in the universe, but who can really know who or what that thing is? You know, I believe that something had to have brought all this into existence, but I don't feel like it's my place to even try to figure out who that is. That kind of general belief in God, the general belief in a creator, general belief in a force, what, what David is, is showing us here is that, that that will be of no comfort to you. That, that if all you know about God is that he's this big creator God, uh, that'll actually make you feel worthless. It will actually be profoundly unsettling to you. And I've, exp- I, I've personally witnessed this. All right, let me shift gears again here. If you were here last week, I began this whole series by explaining that, that this series, maybe more so than any sermon series I've done before, is really personal for me. When I talk about how important it is that we view God clearly, that's not just a, you know, a, an abstract theory. Uh, that, that's a lived experience for me. I talked about last week how I spent a lot of time with a counselor you know, several years ago when I was thinking about making the transition from the fire department to here. And it was during that time in my life that I, I for the first time, came to terms with the reality that I had an incorrect view of God. And it was only when that began to change that I experienced what I would consider deep level transformation in my life that I'd kind of always been waiting to see that, that finally started to happen. The, the, the way that I described it to people back then, it was almost like God had been calling me and I didn't have the ability to pick up the phone. But I did when I, when I began to see him clearly. And so that, that idea, of course, has, has informed not just the way that I preach, but even the way that, that um, you know, I counsel others. And so over the, over the last 10 years, when, I, when I've met with someone one-on-one, and, and some of you know this because, you know, you've met with me, uh, if I knew I was going to meet with, with someone for any length of time, I would always eventually ask them the question, and actually this is a great question for all of us to be asking ourselves all through this series, I'd always ask them to give me five answers to the question, how do you view God? And I, and I would ask for five one-word answers. <clears throat> and in 10 years of ministry, what I've found is that what almost every single person has done when I've asked them that question, they've almost all done the exact same thing. They lied. You bunch of liars. Uh, I mean, it's, you'll see what I mean. What they do, what almost every person does, unless they're in a very raw place in life, what almost everyone does when they're first asked that question is they've told me what the Bible says about God, what they intellectually know about God, what they've been raised to believe about God, but not how they personally view him. And maybe you say, well, that's just semantics, but it's not. It makes all the difference in the world. If somebody comes into my office and says, yeah, I mean, I view God as a loving, kind, merciful, forgiving father... And then in their next breath, they tell me they have no prayer life because they don't believe that God could possibly care for somebody like them. Uh, and they're, they're, they, they go on to tell me that they struggle with, you know, I, I have so much guilt and shame and condemnations over things that I've done, I just can't forgive myself. Then my answer, my loving reply would be, you know that the Bible says that God is a loving, kind, merciful, forgiving Father, but you don't personally view him that way. And so we return to that question as many times as we could until we broke from the right answers and we got to the real answers. And just to give you an idea of how powerful that exercise is, I will tell you on more than one occasion, I have watched people weep uncontrollably when they answered that question honestly for the first time in their life. All right, this is a, um, this person doesn't go to the church, so I'm not, you know, outing anybody right here. But I remember several years ago, I was meeting with a guy, real big, you know, muscly, you know, tattooed guy, just looked like the kind of guy you would not, you know, want to make them angry. And they had some issues, and, and they wanted to talk. They came into the office, and we went through this exercise. And I, and I asked them that question, and I asked them a few times. And I, I don't know if I'll ever forget this. Sitting on the other side of my desk, he looked me dead in the eye, and he said, I feel like he's angry at me all the time. And as soon as he said those words, he must have lost a pound of water weight on the carpet. Because for the first time in his life, he admitted out loud this horrible burden that he'd been carrying around. And, and here's the thing, this is, and this is what I'm trying to drive home in this series. I have no doubt in my mind that before we met together, he was saved, that he had given his life to Jesus, that his account was settled. As, as, as certain as I can be of another person standing before God, I'm that certain that they were saved by grace through faith in the name of Jesus. But let me ask you, how are you going to experience joy in your, in your prayer life? How are you going to approach the throne of grace with confidence and boldness? How are you going to be abounding in the fruit of the Spirit if underneath all of your spiritual activities you believe that God is angry at you all the time, that he's disappointed in you, 
that there's still a little bit in that cup of wrath, that Jesus didn't drink all of it. There's still some left for you. That's a, that's a governor in your relationship with God, and the first step to dealing with that is just admitting it. But all of that to say <clears throat> that when, this is what I found, I, actually, I would say I've, I've, th- this has always been the case. What I have found with every single person I, I've had the opportunity to do this with is that when they finally get to the real answers, how they really view God, basically everybody is right where David is right here in verse 4, meaning they understand that God's a big God. They understand that God is a transcendent God. They understand that he's magnificent. They understand that he's a creator. But in understanding that, one of the most common descriptors is they'll say, he's distant. That's how I, feel. That's how I view God. He's distant. <clears throat> yeah, he's big. Yeah, he's holy. Yeah, he's transcendent. But he's, he's too far away. You know, he's got bigger fish to fry than my stupid little problems. How how could a God like that possibly have time for little old me? And that's essentially exactly where David is here, where he understands how immense God is, how wise, how powerful God is. But what his his response in verse 4 is showing us is that if that's all you know about God, having that big view of God, that alone, that's not enough to comfort you. That's not enough to heal you. That's not enough to change you. That's not enough to transform you. That's not enough to cause you to abound in things like love and joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Because what your heart and what my heart need more than anything else is to know that this God who is magnificent enough to design stars knows you by name, cares about you, and loves you personally. Now that, if I was listening to this, then, then my next question would be, okay, I want to change. I want to abound in, in the, the ways that, you know, the, the, the Bible says I can be changed. I, I would love to be a person who's more loving. I'd love to be transformed by my relationship with God. How can I know that? How can I know that God loves me? What proof is there of that? And there's, there's two questions that arise out of this psalm to that specific question, two things that under the, the uh, inspiration of the Holy Spirit, David points to as, as essentially as proof that you and I should use to more or less argue with our own hearts to remind ourselves that this magnificent God who designed stars actually loves you and I personally. You could break them into two things. It's first off the doctrine of creation and secondly the doctrine of redemption. So with that, uh, we're on the last move of our teaching now. I said we'd look at the amazing thing this says about God, the unsettling question it raises about ourself. Now finally here, uh, we're, we're going to look at this profoundly comforting truth that David learned that, that you and I can learn. First off, David came to understand that God loves us because of creation. Here's what I mean. In verses 5 and 6, it says, You, being God, made him, meaning us, God made us little less than God and crowned us with glory and honor. You made him Lord of the works of your hands. You put everything under his feet. Now, there's some pretty amazing imagery being used there. Um, David talks about being crowned, uh, having glory, having honor, having dominion. And if you, if you know what the Bible has to say about God, you know that all of those things are attributes that are usually ascribed to God. And yet here in Psalm 8, those attributes are being ascribed to you. So what this is, it's David recalling the biblical account of creation, which tells us that you and I were not only created by God, but we were stamped with his image. So just so you understand what's happening here, David is reminding himself that one of the ways we can know that God loves us is because he's created us in his image. Now, if that sounds kind of, uh, you know, a little bit too abstract or what difference does that really make, I think it makes all the difference in the world, especially given the cultural moment we're in now. Because what this is, the doctrine of, of you and I and, and, and all people being created in the image of God, uh, first and foremost, this is an incredible resource for psychological self-worth. Let me, let me walk through this for a minute. There's a tendency a lot of times with modern people, and I'll, I'll, I'll make you a bet. <clears throat> if you know people who are not Christian, uh, or, or maybe you've, you've, you've thought this yourself, I can promise even if you haven't thought this, you know and love people who do. There's a tendency a lot of times with modern people to reject Christianity because uh, of, the, of, of the perception that Christianity creates a dangerously low sense of self-worth and its adherence. Some of you have heard this before, because Christianity is the belief system that says you're a terrible person who's a sinner, and you're so bad uh, that you deserve to die, but you better count yourself lucky. This guy named Jesus died for you, and now you're supposed to live your life 
with basically a wholly low self-esteem to try to pay him back. I just want to pause here and say, I feel like I say that all the time. There's a lot of pauses in my messages, but I want to pause here and say, if that's what Christianity taught, I would not be a Christian, comma, that's not what Christianity teaches. If, if you survey all that, 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 that this book, that this belief system says about you, I really think you will find a more balanced and nuanced um, picture of people than you'll find anywhere else. Because on the one hand, while, while the Bible does say that mankind is deeply fall, flawed, in need of salvation, and incapable of saving itself, which that, that goes further already than any other belief system does, what Christianity also says at the same time, Christianity will give you a higher estimation of your own personal self-worth than any other belief system out there. Here, here's why I say that. If you compare the creation account of Scripture, what the Bible says about you, to the creation accounts of, of, of really nearly any other belief system, what you'll find is that outside of Christianity, mankind is generally seen uh, as, as nothing but an accidental byproduct. In fact, I, I was re- doing some research this week, and what I found is that in, in, in every other Western culture, uh, in all of their creation accounts, uh, creation was basically seen as the accidental result of a power struggle. Uh, So whether you go to the Old Norse, German, Babylonian, Sumerian, Egyptian, Greek, Roman, all of them essentially, it's a different version of the same thing, that there was this uh, battle between gods or godlike beings, and and as a result of that, creation generally, and mankind specifically, was sort of the accidental byproduct. Not created on purpose, not created with a purpose, just kind of, it happened. Uh, Now you say, well, there's ancient myths and legends, nobody believes that anymore, but I'd ask you to consider the modern secular account of creation because it's really not that different, right? The modern account of how you got to be here is that there was nothing, and then there was a big bang, and over billions of years, the universe impersonally evolved until uh, conditions were just right for, you know, us to accidentally show up. Now, with that in mind, I want to read a quote to you I came across this week from a Bertrand Russell. He's a famous 20th century secular philosopher. The quote that I'm going to read you, all this is, he's not an extremist. All this is, is what secularism says about you. You'll see where I'm going with this in just a minute. It's a little heady, but follow me. That man is the product of causes that had no prevision of the end they were achieving. That man's origin, growth, hopes, fears, loves, and beliefs are but the outcome of accidental collocations of atoms, that all the labors of the ages, all the devotion, all the inspiration, all the noonday brightness of human genius are destined to extinction in the vast death of the solar system. Here's how he he lands the plane. Only within the scaffolding of these truths, only on the firm foundation of unyielding despair can the soul's habitation henceforth be safely built. Just fills you with the joy of the Lord, does it not? If I can sort of layman terms what's being said here, this is just what modern secularism teaches about you. And what it's saying is, pardon the expression, you're the unplanned pregnancy of the universe. And what Russell's saying is that if, if you can't accept that you come from meaninglessness, Accidental collocation of atoms. If you can't accept that you're heading for meaninglessness, it's all going to burn up in the vast death of the solar system, and that your life, therefore, is meaningless. If you're not willing to accept that, then you just don't have the courage to face the truth. So, that being said, let, let's ask the question, what kind of psychological resources does that provide to an individual? Let, let, me, let me use just two examples that perhaps are really personal for some of us. Let's say you have someone who's struggling with suicidal thoughts because they believe that their life doesn't matter, that they don't have any worth, that they don't have any dignity, that they don't have any value. What is that understanding of them going to offer them to change their mind? Answer, nothing. Let's say you have somebody who looks out into the world and they see uh, people groups being marginalized and oppressed and mistreated, uh, all of that. How is a secular worldview, a secular understanding of human beings going to motivate them to go out and fight for the rights, for equality, for the justice of that marginalized people group? Answer, it won't. And so pardon me if I sound like I got a little bit of a chip on my shoulder, but to be honest with you, it's, I find it very frustrating as a Christian minister 
that Christianity has so often been painted as this belief system that will give you, you know, a devastatingly low view of yourself and then choose to dehumanize and marginalize people, when at just the, at the very beginning of this book, at the very beginning of it, it tells you what really no other belief system dares to tell you, which is not only are you not an accident, not only were you designed on purpose by God, but he stamped his image on you. What that means is that every single man, woman, and child you ever come across is a person of intrinsic and infinite value, worth, and dignity. And to attempt to rob them of that is a crime not only against them, but against God himself. Christianity taught that long before anybody thought it was cool to talk about human rights, uh, uh, rights in a given society. So this, is, this doctrine of, of, of the creation of mankind in the image of God it is an incredible resource for psychological self-worth. It's an incredible resource for fighting for justice in a given society. Uh, and, and it's what David looked at initially as the proof that God really does care about us. If I left here, you would probably say, that's really intellectual, it's interesting, it's abstract, but that doesn't really do something for my heart. That's where I want to turn next, and this will be the last, thing, uh, the last move that, that we cover today. The, the second thing that... Um, that David, he almost accidentally points to it. I don't think he realized he was pointing to it because he was writing under inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God uh, that, that David talks about here as evidence that God loves you. It's not just the doctrine of creation, it's the doctrine of redemption. And it's, it's hinted at in verse four. Now, in, in my version of, of verse four, I read it to you already. It says, what's man that you remember him, the son of man that you look after him? If you read this in a King James version of the Bible, here's what it'll say. What is man that thou art mindful of him? And pay attention to this second question. Or the son of man that thou visitest him? <clears throat> Maybe you're asking the question, why would the older versions translate that word visit and newer translations uh, translate it look after or care for? The answer is because the Hebrew word that's used here means both. The Hebrew word David, David uses here uh, describes someone who cares so much about someone else that they actually go looking for them. They actually go and find them. Now, David writing Psalm 8 would have had no idea exactly how true his words would go on to become, but of course, living on the other side of the New Testament, you and I can see in the New Testament, specifically in the gospel accounts, that God, in fact, did literally physically care enough about us to come down here and look for us, and he did so in the person and work of Jesus. And this psalm points to the work of Jesus in a very peculiar but a very powerful way, which when rightly understood is the final apologetic for why you can know God actually loves you. I, I want to, last verse we'll look at, it, it's here in verse 2. Uh, most people, I think if they're honest, when they read through Psalm 8 and they get to verse 2, they kind of just blow past it because it doesn't even sound like it fits in here. It certainly doesn't sound like it um, makes a whole lot of sense in the, other, in, in the context of everything else David's saying about God. But what's so interesting about verse 2 is it's the only psalm, it's the only verse from Psalm 8 that Jesus ever quoted during his time here. Let me read verse 2 to you. Because of your adversaries... You've established a stronghold from the mouths of children and nursing infants to silence the enemy and the avenger. <clears throat> Not to be cheeky, but I do feel like I should point out, because of the Marvel franchise, we tend to think the word avenger is a positive thing. It's, that's not how it's meant here. That word literally means a vengeful, spiteful, hateful person. So here's what verse 2 is saying, and, and I think you'll understand when I, when I, why I say that at least initially it just doesn't sound like it fits here. Uh, verse 2 is saying what you and I already know, that this world is full of evil people who perpetuate evil. It's full of adversaries, enemies, and, and vengeful, spiteful people. It's full of evil. We all know that. But what verse 2 is saying is that in the most backwards way possible, this God, who we learn in verses 1 and 3 is magnificent enough to design stars with his fingers that the way that this God is going to deal with the evil of this world is from the mouths of children and infants. It's an incredibly strange-sounding verse. But again, it's the only verse from this psalm that Jesus personally quoted. So to understand what it means, let's look at how he used it. In Matthew's Gospel account, chapter 21, it's the triumphal entry. It's days before the crucifixion, and Jesus is riding into Jerusalem. But he's doing so as the Messiah that no one expected. 
In Jesus' day, people assumed that when the Messiah arrived, he'd be the picture of strength, he'd command an army, and he'd conquer the enemies of God's people. Instead, in Matthew 21, Jesus is riding into Jerusalem, no army to speak of, and he's doing so on a donkey. And when Jesus arrives to the temple complex in Jerusalem, Scripture tells us that the the army, quote-unquote, that was flocking toward him was comprised of the poor, the blind, the lame, and children. And the religious leaders looking on at Jesus, who had this, this, basically this crowd of misfits flocking around him, they were appalled that Jesus would allow people like that to come to him. You know, the unclean, uh, you know, people that, that it was thought God must be angry at them or else why would he allow them to have that lot in life? And so the, uh, the religious leaders, as, as they're so often depicted in the gospel accounts, they're just portrayed in a really negative light there. And Jesus quotes verse 2 from Psalm 8 at them, and he does so as a rebuke. This is what he says. Have you never read? You have prepared praise from the mouths of children and nursing infants. What Jesus is saying to the religious leaders of his day, he's saying, your job might be to teach people about God, but you still know nothing about him. You still have so little understanding of how God works in this world. And what Jesus is explaining is that as magnificent as God is, He deals with evil in a way that frequently confounds our understanding and our expectations because the way that God deals with evil, pay attention to this phrase, God deals with evil not through strength but through weakness. When you understand that about God, it explains a lot of of what you read in the Old Testament. If, If you have the time, just read through Genesis as God's beginning his, his salvific work in the world. And it's amazing how many times, I mean, case study after case study after case study, it's just amazing how often God intentionally chooses to use the unwanted woman, the least loved son, uh, the, the person or the couple who were too old to be seen as useful in the eyes of their society. They, were, they had squandered their potential. They were past their prime. It's always the widow. It's always the foreigner. It's always the person with the least societal capital and strength. Over and over, God goes out of his way to use people that fit into that category, and it begs the question why, and the answer is that God was pointing forward to something he was going to finally do in Jesus. He was whispering about something he would finally declare openly and loudly in the person of Jesus, because in the greatest demonstration of this concept that we're looking at in chapter 2, that it would be children, it would be out of the mouth of children and infants that evil would be dealt with in the world, in the greatest demonstration of the fulfillment of that concept God entered human history in the person of Jesus Christ, and he came down here as an infant himself. He came down here as a baby, not laid in a palace, but laid in a manger, born in poverty, grew up and lived his life as a homeless man. He said, the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head, and at the end of his life, in order to redeem his people and to conquer the enemies that had enslaved us since that horrible day in Genesis chapter 3, Jesus Christ allowed himself to be publicly humiliated and killed in the most shameful way possible by being nailed to a Roman cross, which nobody, not even his closest confidants, could see coming. Now, when I was putting this, this um, teaching together and thinking specifically about this concept, there's one specific scene from one specific movie that came to my mind. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen, it was one of the last movies that Heath Ledger made. It was called A Knight's Tale. Um, in that movie, Heath Ledger's character is named William. He, he's a low-born peasant, which in a caste system, you know, what you're born as is what you're going to die as. But he's provided with this amazing opportunity to pose as a knight. And so he enters a tournament, and it turns out he's actually pretty good at jousting and winds up dominating his opponents and so he, he, you know, classic love story, he falls in love with this princess. Her name's Jocelyn. And at one point in the movie, he's trying to win Jocelyn over. <clears throat> and he's talking to her uh, in some kind of monastery, cathedral type thing. And he says, uh, uh, he says he's going to win this next tournament that he's entered into. He says he's going to win it for her, and she's completely not impressed. And, uh, and I actually, I, I, I had to look up the scene on YouTube. I listened to it about 30 different times so I could type you out verbatim exactly how the dialogue goes. This is exactly how it goes. And you will, I, I swear to you, there's a point to this. <clears throat> he asks her the question when he says, I'm, I'm going to win this tournament for you. Totally not impressed, walks away from him. He asks her, how can I prove my love to you? And if you think about it, 
That's really the cry of David's heart in Psalm chapter 8. He sees how big this God is, that he can design stars with his fingers, but he's wondering, is there room in that God's mind for me? Is there room in that God's heart for me? How can I know that you love me? He says, how can I prove my love to you? And this is exactly what she says. If you would prove your love, then do your worst. Instead of winning to honor me with your high reputation, I want you to act against your normal character and do badly. Lose. And he looks at her. He's immediately crestfallen. None of that makes sense to him. And he tells her the only thing that losing would prove is that I'm a loser. Because he's this low-born peasant. He's, his whole life is kind of dependent on him you know, winning the next bout. And he's, he's, he says, I can't do that. All that would prove is that I'm a loser. And she answers him back, and she says, wrong. Losing is a much keener test of your love. Losing would contradict your self-love. So he looks at her, and he says, I will not lose. And she looks at him and says, then you do not love me. And the scene ends. The movie goes on, and the tournament that he was entered in begins. And at this point, he's famous. So there's, you know, it's a packed house. Thousands of people there today to see Sir William. And uh, the princess is there, Jocelyn. And his team seats him on his horse, and he's in his armor, and he's got his jousting spear, and he's galloping down the path toward his opponent. And suddenly, he stops dead in his tracks. And he lets his spear fall, and he allows his opponent to, not just to beat him, but to publicly humiliate him in front of not only the princess, but all the thousands of spectators that day. He puts his entire reputation on the line. And it's only then that the princess learns that this guy actually does love her because she knew that anybody would, anybody would profess to win that tournament for her. That costs them nothing personally, but she knew only someone who truly loved her would be willing to lose for her. And I can't think of a better picture of what the gospel is revealing to us about God because what the gospel is, is, is telling you is that God loves you enough to become weak for you. He loved you enough to become killable for you. He loved you enough to set aside his power and set aside his glory for you. He loved you enough, essentially, to lose. And the book of Hebrews tells us that Jesus, he endured the cross but he did so despising the shame. I don't know if this needs to be said. Jesus did not enjoy the cross. And he certainly did not face it with a stoic resignation. He despised the shame of the cross to the point. That's why he was on his hands and knees in the Garden of Gethsemane, sweat like drops of blood, calling out to the Father, Father, if there's any other way to do what needs to be done, if there's any other way to get them back, if there's any other way to reunite them in our family, then let this cup pass from me. But if this is the only way, if this is the only way to win them, if this is the only way to save them, then not my will but yours be done. Scripture says he, he despised the shame, that it, but he endured the cross for one reason, for the joy that was set before him, and I don't know if you've ever heard this before, but the joy that was set before him was you. The only thing that Jesus did not have before the cross that he could only get through the cross was you. And in the most stunning display of reversal that mankind can conceive of, Jesus Christ, the God-man, was willing to lose for you. There is no greater proof in existence that the God who designs stars loves you, cares about you, knows you by name than that. Now, we've arrived at the end of our time today. I want to call the worship team up and, 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 and remind us that the heart behind this whole series is that rather than just intellectually understanding what these passages are revealing to us about God, um, this whole series is about being counseled by what this says about God. So what I'd like to do is close by helping us think through just how this truth about God can and should change our lives. In my experience... Just about every human being, and I'm sure there's a lot of people on the other side of me right now, you'd say you fall into this category, just about every human being I've ever met deals with bitterness and anxiety, which are really just two sides of the same coin. Bitterness is about what did happen to you. Anxiety is about what did not happen yet. 
And underneath both of those things is a failure to grasp what David grasps personally in Psalm 8, that God is this magnificent designer. I mean, all bitterness is, all bitterness is, is believing that God got it wrong. All anxiety is, is worrying that God will not get it right. And underneath both of those is a failure to grasp what David grasped here, that God is a magnificent designer. He is really good at designing things, and you and I would be fools to doubt that the God who designs stars is not capable of designing your and my life. And while his designs so often seem to cut across and confound our understanding and our expectations, this God has proven once and for all how much he loves you by sending you his son Jesus. Here's what that means today, and I'll leave you with this. Even if you can't see why you had the childhood you had, even if you can't see why you've had the disappointments you've had, even if you can't see why your life has taken the turns that it has, even if you can't see why you're going through what you're going through now, what Psalm 8 would say to you is God knows what he's doing with you. He designed the universe. You can trust him to design your life. And in Jesus, the infant that overcame the power of the grave, overcame the power of sin, and one day will return to rid this world of evil once and for all, the promise of the gospel for all who put their trust in Jesus, the one to whom this psalm points, the promise we hold on to, is that though we may never see it fully in this life, one day, everyone who gives their life to Jesus will be able to personally see, know, and understand that the God who designed planets has caused everything in your life to work together for your good. My hope simply as we leave today is that you would walk out of here with all of the peace, all of the confidence, all of the poise, all of the joy that that affords you. That's it. That's all. And instead of inventing a prayer to end our time with, just let me read Psalm 8 over us, if you'd bow with me. Yahweh, our Lord, how magnificent is your name throughout the earth. You've covered the heavens with your majesty. Because of your adversaries, you've established a stronghold from the mouths of children and nursing infants to silence the enemy and the avenger. When I observe your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you set in place, what is man that you remember him, the son of man that you look after him? You made him little less than God and crowned him with glory and honor. You made him Lord over the works of your hands. You put everything under his feet, all the sheep and oxen, as well as the animals in the wild, the birds of the sky and the fish of the sea that pass through the currents of the seas. Yahweh, our Lord, how magnificent is your name throughout the earth. Amen. Amen.